Good evening. How are all of you? Driving? Yeah, me too. I mean, this is just blowing my mind, so I'm just going to leave and come back in like two minutes. OK, but I guess I can't do that, because I am today's second speaker, which means all my jokes and good looks don't really measure up to that of the ruggedly handsome Rob Stevens, <laughs> who did an amazing job today. Really, it was such a pleasure. Um, so as you know, my name is Kriti. And I am the only one standing in between you and everything else you could possibly be doing right now. And it feels so good to be here. <laughs> in fact, when I invited all of you, I didn't honestly expect everyone to show up. But really, thanks for pulling through. Now we're all trapped here for 20 minutes. <laughs> Fantastic. Let the Hunger Games begin. I would like to volunteer my RA staff as tributes. <laughs> I love you all. <laughs> Um, but before we get to all the good blood and gore that I'm sure Game of Thrones has conditioned you to love, um, I have the fortune of really fulfilling all my narcissistic desires today, so I'm just going to get on with my story. And it begins with a doll. The doll in question is a Russian nesting doll, or a matryoshka doll. And for those of you who don't know, it's like one of those dolls that has um, smaller versions of the same doll within it. So there's a big carrier doll and then smaller versions in it. And if you put them all out, then you have a series. And I have a doll like this at home. And I've had it since I was a youth, since I was five years old. And it's always simultaneously intrigued and fascinated me to no end. While I used to actually spend hours putting this doll together and taking it apart, I would always think about a bunch of different questions. For example, why are there so many? Why do they all look the same? Can I eat one? Definitely eat the smallest one, right? I was a really curious five-year-old. I also used to wonder, are they all the same person? Are they the same person when you put them together? Or are they different people? Which one is real and which one are just copies? Over time, I've come to realize that people, us, are quite like the Matryoshka doll. Regardless of how we look like on the outside, on the inside, we are covered in layers of experiences, stories, and memories that make us who we are. So today, I hope to share some of my stories from my CMU journey in an effort so that they resonate with some of yours as we all attempt to unravel the matryoshka doll of who we are. Now, when I first started at Carnegie Mellon, it was a day quite like this, rainy, gloomy, wet, <laughs> Pittsburgh year gem. Um, I started off architecture school as a really bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, first-year architect architecture student just so excited to be starting what I had heard would be the best and most exhilarating time of my life. I had one and one and only plan, and that was to get through architecture school with flying colors, secure a job at an international architecture firm, and um, not just be a good architect, but a great one. In fact, I even had a list of all the dream projects I wanted to conquer as soon as I got my job and license. And I know what you're all thinking. She's trash. <laughs> Anyways, as we all know, most things don't really go according to plan. And to say that I hated architecture school would be a severe, severe understatement. There were days when I would walk to studio. I can't believe you're laughing, David. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> So there were days, anyway, um, that I would walk to studio and stare at the door and turn around and walk all the way back home because I couldn't physically bring myself to be in a room that I detested so much just to get my, just to get my work done. I would actually take my work to Gesling, the football stadium, sometimes to my room, sometimes to the library, just to look for excuses to be anywhere else. Most nights I would cry myself to sleep, defeated, exhausted, frustrated. And most of all, so, so scared. I was terrified. After six months of this negative emotional roller coaster, I finally decided that I had enough and it wasn't worth it anymore. One morning I woke up, called my parents, and told them that I didn't want to pursue architecture. They were so happy, so relieved, and I was finally free. Or so I thought. <laughs> I thought deciding to switch my major would put the worst of my problems behind me, but little did I know that the toughest journey was yet to come. It was a very classic, classic case of out of the frying pan and into the fire. I had absolutely no clue what I wanted to do next after dropping architecture. I had only ever had a plan A, never even contemplated the idea of having a plan B. And for someone who's always been 
incredibly sure of herself or who has always at least had some sort of plan, this was incredibly terrifying to come to terms with. I realized that I could no longer take my matryoshka doll at face value anymore. I really had to start peeling back the layers, thinking, thinking harder, digging deeper, to really figure out what I wanted to do next. And so, that's what I did for my entire sophomore year. 10 months, all I did was look for a major. I went through so many different options. I tried business, economics, IS, HCI, psychology, history, creative writing, even logic and computation, a major that I didn't know existed. I tried everything. I talked to people for advice and perspective and for help mainly. During sophomore year, instead of crying to myself to sleep at night, I would lay awake wondering if I'd ever be passionate about something again. If I would even get to continue being at Carnegie Mellon because I didn't know if I was gonna get accepted into a new major. And most of all, just really lost at who I was and where I was going. I was literally on the highway to hell without even knowing how to drive or how to sing. <laughs> Every single day, I would tell myself, it's going to be okay. Go to class, make sure to eat something, get your homework done, and check your horoscope. Maybe this is because of Mars and Pluto and has nothing to do with you. It's gonna be fine. <laughs> I finally, finally switched into my major, statistics, during the finals week of sophomore year. It was literally a race to the very end. And it was in this darkness, ambiguity, and chaos of my freshman and sophomore year at Carnegie Mellon that I really found my strength and courage. In the words of Franklin D. Roosevelt, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something is more important. There was never a time when I wasn't scared out of my wits, but I knew I had to do it anyway. Courage is something that we all have, both despite our imperfections and because of them. It manifests itself in different forms and looks different on everyone. It can be as simple as asking someone for help, asking your professor for an extension, telling your best friend that no, you can't go to something even though you really, really want to, or even just calling it a day and deciding that you're gonna try again tomorrow. All of these things take courage, especially because your education is not a promise to your family. It's not an obligation to your peers or your professors. Your education is a commitment to yourself. It is an experience that is as free and as brave as you are and that only you can foster. You are your own education. And I know that all of us in this room have aspirations and goals that we want to achieve, a life of our dreams that we want to live. But to do so, we have to be brave enough to embrace the change that comes with it. And that is the first thing Carnegie Mellon has taught me, that it's okay to fall down because the world looks very different from down there. So go ahead, fall down, find your courage, and be brave. Now, finding my courage was not a journey that I made all by myself. A lot of my strength came from the people that I chose to surround myself with. Not everyone in this room, but like definitely some of you. <laughs> It came from the friends who would stay up with me as I worried and fretted about my situation at the time, all the while reassuring me even though no one really knew what was yet to come. It came from my roommate who shared her mother's home-cooked food with me and took me home some weekends just so I wouldn't have to be alone. And it came from the WhatsApp messages my mom would send me every morning filled with all these kissy emojis and terrible jokes that made just getting out of bed a little easier every day. More importantly, it came from three individuals who were pivotal in my CMU journey. One, Lucia. Lucia was my transitional advisor, and she was there from the minute I dropped architecture to being the first person I called up as soon as I got admitted into the statistics program. She was the hope that I never had, the person whose shoulder I would cry on almost every other week, and she is the sole reason I am on the course to graduate with a Bachelor of Science this May. Two, Catherine. Catherine was my tutor from academic development during my freshman and sophomore year. She not only helped me with my coursework, but also with my time management skills, which are currently still a work in progress. I'm really trying. Um, not only did she help me with that, but she also went above and beyond to help me with my process of switching my major because she had been in a similar situation during her time at Carnegie Mellon. 
She would text me every day to see how things were going. She would even, in fact, call me because she knows of my tendency to fall asleep as a way to ignore my problems, something I think I'll always do for the rest of my life. Um, but she never had to do any of that, and she did it anyway. And last but not least is John, who was the assistant professor in Woodshop when I was a freshman. Now, I, I just hated wood shop, okay? I, with like every fiber of my being, despised wood shop. In fact, this is extremely unhealthy, but sometimes I wouldn't even care if I lost a finger just if it meant that I could catch a break. Now, one particularly horrible day in wood shop, John came up to me and asked me how I was doing. And I flat out said that I don't want to be here, I hate wood shop, I don't know what to do. And he said, well, let me help you because I was in your place once and I know it sucks. Now this really small, quiet, 60 second interaction meant so much to me. And it's this unexpected act of kindness that I'll never forget. And it's the reason why John is my favorite professor today and probably always will be from CMU. Now, these people are important because my courage came from not only these three people, but a lot of others who showed me kindness when I least expected it, but needed it the most. They taught me how to be brave by being kind, and that both of them go hand in hand. The main point is that we cannot go through Carnegie Mellon alone. We are here to connect. Everyone is going through struggles of their own. So take that time and reach out. Take five minutes to talk to your friend and actually ask how they're doing. Just spend the time talking to people around you. Make the extra effort, and it will have a ripple effect on the rest of your life. And what I'm trying to say here is I'm not claiming that I am a kind person, but I am saying that I try to practice compassion. And this is because we're all here today, but one day, you'll just be a memory to some people. So do your best to be a good one. Be kind. That is the second thing Carnegie Mellon has taught me. Now, after struggling my first two years at Carnegie Mellon, I finally came to the promised land. I was an upperclassman. Junior year, here we are. After struggling for two years, I finally had a major, so that meant nothing that I could probably face in the future would be as bad as things that I had faced before. I had already gone through two years, so you know I was ready. Like, come at me. There's nothing that you can't throw at me that I can't experience again. And most importantly, I was an upperclassman, not a pleb. I got this. I totally, totally got this. But as you all know, there's always a few curveballs in store. I started off junior year super excited to be an orientation counselor for whose house? My house. house. Yeah. OK, I was so excited. And I was really ready. And then here comes Sunday of orientation, move-in day, literally the first day. And I sprained my ankle, and I was on crutches for the rest of the week. So this meant no OC dance, no play fair, no house wars, no quintessential aspect of the OC experience that everyone looks forward to. And there really wasn't a lot of scope to bond with my staff because I was always hobbling 10 feet behind everyone else. Two, my class is junior year, surprisingly or not so surprisingly, were classes that I really didn't enjoy taking, especially my core statistics classes, 36, 225, and 226. Can I get an amen, Dietrich? <laughs> yeah. And I was so disappointed because all I really wanted was to find something to study that I also actually really liked. It seemed like everyone else, everyone else had it. Why couldn't I? And last but not least, the first half of my spring semester junior year was probably one of the lowest points I've ever experienced at CMU. I hated everything. I hated school. And I hated just looking in the mirror and seeing my reflection. I couldn't stand the thought of myself. And going to school every day, going to class, was a Herculean effort. I don't know how I pulled it off. Um, but the reason I'm telling you about all these instances is because they taught me the most important lesson I've learned at, Carne learned at Carnegie Mellon today, and that's to be grateful. They reminded me of the days that I yearned for the things that I had then, finally. A major, leadership positions that I was really humbled to have. And more importantly, some sort of direction even though it wasn't something that I was really sure about at the time. I realized that I had weathered the storm up until then, and even though the aftermath wasn't perfect, it doesn't mean it wasn't good. 
While my third year here was really tum wasn't as tumultuous as my first two, it's in the everyday, in the painstaking ins and outs, that I really learned to appreciate the people and the circumstances of my life. Thinking about what I have to be grateful helps me find my courage and my compassion. Now do you see how it all kind of comes full circle? Being brave, being kind, and being grateful. The crux of my personal mantra is that our time here at this institution comes down to the choices that we make. Whether it's the insignificant ones or the big life decisions, all of these things matter. So go buy the chocolate croissant and the Oreos and the chocolate pretzels or just two out of the three, I don't know. But be kind to yourself and indulge just the way you are kind to others. Ask the TA in the review session to go over that problem, even if everybody else, whether you know them or not, thinks you're stupid. Be brave, because you have nothing to lose. And when you see another student, a friend, or an underclassman struggling, stop and try to take the time to help in any capacity you can. Because you were them once. You know what it's like. And you are grateful for the experience that has shaped you today. And this is, in fact, the most important. Because all of us here want to do well. But if you do not do good too, then doing well will never be enough. I've come to realize that life is a tapestry woven by the decisions that we make. So I hope that everyone here lives a life that they are proud of. And if you are not, then you have the courage and you give yourself the compassion to start over choice by choice, day by day. It's hard to believe, I guess, that it could be so simple. But it's real and it's true. And that's because when I was a freshman, I was sitting in that chair, coming to a first lecture as a reason to avoid my work, hoping for some sort of inspiration or clarity. And day by day, choice by choice, I found myself here. So if I can do it, then you can. It's really not that hard anymore. I think everyone thinks that looking at walking to the sky, that the direction of our CMU journey is upward. And it may be so, but I truly believe that the direction that our CMU journey takes is that of the Matryoshka doll. Or even for you Westworld fans out there, the way the maze goes to the center. It's inward. The most important thing that I've learned here at Carnegie Mellon, by being brave, by being kind, and by being grateful, is who I am. And not necessarily where I'm going to be or where I want to be, but just how to get there, choice by choice, to be or not to be, every day. Thank you.